Welcome everyone. My name is Michael Link and I'm the director of uh, basically books at Joseph Beth. And we're thrilled to have so many of you here. Uh, just quick housekeeping um, so that everyone can just uh, relax and enjoy the event. Uh, we have suspended uh, the chat for the duration of it. Um, so you can sit back, relax and enjoy. Um, I'm excited. I'm thrilled. Uh, Joseph Beth, I don't know how many of you um, have either attended our events for Ready Player One um, or Armada, but we've been huge fans of tonight's author, um, as obviously so are you and so are millions of people around the world um, for a long time. I remember reading this book before it came out and realizing immediately how special it was going to be. So I'm excited to introduce Ernest Klein. Ernest is the number one New York Times bestselling author of Ready Player One, Armada, and now Ready Player Two, the book that I think is here to save 2020. In 2011, here he is in 2011. Hey. Yeah, hey in 2011, uh, Ernest published his blockbuster debut, Ready Player One. Uh, filled with irresistible nostalgia and depicting a future changed by social media, virtual reality, and video games. One that we all seem to be trapped in now. Um, <coughs> excuse me, the cinematic novel was immediately embraced by all of us, by readers, by booksellers, and critics alike around the world, and went on to spend more than 100 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. It was adapted, I believe, into a film um, by a, an upstart director, um, a scrappy young man, uh, <laughs> the hugely successful blockbuster directed by Steven Spielberg uh, with a screenplay co-written uh, in a plot twist that nobody could see coming by Ernest. Um, now, nine years later, we're incredibly excited to that Ready Player Two has now been published, taking us once again into the Oasis and bringing us back to our friend Wade Watts and his friends for another imaginative, fun, action-packed adventure and jolting us thrillingly into the future once again, or the present, <laughs> sadly. Uh, I read it as, uh, as soon as it came out, and then um, I actually immediately bought the audiobook as well. Um, and it was sort of, uh, it was this, this warmth of hearing uh, Will Wheaton and revisiting it again. Um, it's truly awesome. So it's my pleasure once again, even remotely, to welcome back to Joseph Beth, Mr. Ernest Klein. Thank you so much for having me. I've been uh, looking forward to this event. Um, and uh, I want to thank you guys again. Uh, a bunch of your uh, patients probably remember uh, you like, how's my DeLorean? This DeLorean for like a month, it broke down. I, I went on my first, I think it was my first book tour. Uh, and uh, I was driving around the country and my DeLorean broke down right as I was making it to Joseph Beth. And so I had to limp like the last mile in first gear and then it just sat in your parking lot for like a month. So uh, yeah, well, I remember, <laughs> uh, yeah, we actually, I was, I was telling some of uh, your team uh, how funny it was because every day we would come in and the DeLorean would be there and more of your fans that had read the book because it was it was one of the first events on the tour yeah, yeah. we're then we're then showing back up post event each day and taking pictures <laughs> and then when it left it left we started getting calls like is the delorean gone is the delorean gone so i was like we should probably invest in this um, a good sales tool uh, yeah you can see. Exactly. It, they're selling books right behind me well, you guys can see now i have my second my star wars delorean which i don't know if you can see i added i've added laser cannons to the doors so when it goes up when the wings come up then it locks x foils into attack position and and i uh, and that you guys were hearing r2 before because i was testing him out uh so if he if if you ask questions that uh i don't want to hear then i'll just have r2 shake his head no that's amazing well congratulations on the release of ready player two it's already the biggest uh, novel of the year for us. And I'm sure that it's going to be one of the biggest novels, not the biggest novel of 2020. And it's now on sale in the US and the UK, but I understand it's gonna be published in more than 50 countries around the world in the next year. Yeah, that's what that they told me. Yeah, I'm getting, uh, yeah, I'm getting emails from all my, from all my translators. They send me the coolest questions about how to translate, you know, uh, American pop culture into other 
languages and make it match for their readers. It's pretty cool. And uh, in, in a special sort of Ohio only, I know that you have some uh, spectacular bookstores and, and different partners for events. Um, it is my pleasure to once again, and I remember doing this at uh, the last event, um, we have a special proclamation from the city of Middletown, Ohio, that I would like <laughs> to read. Uh, whereas Ernest Klein is a number one New York Times bestselling novelist, screenwriter, father, and full-time geek. You might be the only person in the history of Middletown, Ohio, to receive a proclamation for being a father and full-time geek. Uh, he is the author of the novels Ready Player One and Armada and the co-screenwriter of the film adaptation of Ready Player One, directed by Steven Spielberg. His books have been published in over 50 countries and have spent more than 100 weeks, as I mentioned, on the New York Times bestseller list. Whereas Ready Player Two was released on November 24th and once again features James Holliday, the fictional native of Middletown, Ohio, pursuing his treasure hunt through the Oasis, finds fictional metaverse where you can live, play, and be anything you want to be. And now, therefore, I, not I, Nicole Condry, by virtue of the authority vested in me as the mayor of the city of Middletown, do hereby proclaim this day, November 30th of uh, 2020, to be, once again, author Ernest Klein Day in the city of Middletown, Ohio. That's so cool. <laughs> I've got the first proclamation framed, so I can't wait to, I'll put that right beside. I, uh, um, I, I think I went and visited Middletown when I, after I went uh, uh, to your store for the first time. I'd never actually, I'd driven through there before, but I never spent time. Uh, so the, the, yeah, if I remember correctly, you posted that morning a picture in front of Middletown spirits and liquor or yes. something like that, because it was the sign you could find. Yeah, I could only, it's the only sign I could find with the name Middletown on it to prove uh, that I had uh, been there. But uh <laughs> Uh, I've told other fans before, there's a, a, the reason I picked Middletown is because um, uh, even though I'd grown up in Ashland was because uh, there's a Middletown everywhere. I think almost every state has a Middletown uh, in it. And that is what inspired uh, Neil Peart from Rush to write the song Middletown Dreams uh, about, you know, people trapped in Middletown in different Middletowns. And so uh, that was a, that was a veiled Rush reference, but now I'm getting proclamations from the real Middletown is pretty amazing. So thank you for that. Yeah, of course, our pleasure. And it was funny, I, I mentioned earlier that um, they immediately, the first time I sort of had to explain what was going on and that you weren't from there, but the uh, character in the book was from there. And, you know, like, and so now this time they immediately knew. As soon as I mentioned it, they're like, oh, he's coming back. Like they are on, they are dialed in to the Ernest Klein universe. And, and their special place in it. So it, it was it was pretty funny to talk to uh, to all of them. That's well, congratulations cool. on the release of this book. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I was when Random House first emailed me before it even was announced and was like, hey, just so that you know, we know you guys are huge fans and you're going to sell a pile of them because we're probably somewhere over 6,000 copies uh, in Cincinnati of Ready Player One. Like, it's just been a huge, wow. iconic book that I think a lot of people now, you know, um, uh, readers of Joseph Bath, like, you know, identify with us. So uh, we were thrilled, you know, to, uh, to, ha to have this come out. And um, for people who haven't read it yet, it's every bit as good as you're hoping it is. It's such a gift. Um, and just sort of, you know, I kind of alluded to this. Um, in Ready Player One, you imagined, you know, a time where the world had endured a pandemic, we're in severe economic depression, um, environmental, you know, degradation, reality TV stars were elected political leaders, and kids attended schools remotely uh, in virtual classrooms um, through, you know, devices, um, you know, sometimes by themselves, sometimes, you know, uh, and humanity escapes the ugly real world into the safety of this oasis, this virtual universe. Um, I imagine you're feeling awfully prophetic right now. And it was such, it ends up being such a, a weirdly prescient book for this year. Um, so I guess kind of two questions. Immediately behind you, there are DeLoreans. So, and I know that in, in your original one, you had a, a flex capacitor, which at the time, I thought it was a replica, but is it an actual time machine? And 
what has it been like seeing your book and sort of the things that you saw in, in science fiction uh, become a reality in so many different ways? Um, and I'm assuming like as you were working on the second book. Yeah, well, that was one thing that I um, uh, had to think about when I sat down to write uh, Ready Player Two, because I by then I was, you know, when I when I uh, published Ready Player One, you couldn't buy a virtual reality headset you know, commercially, they were not available. Uh, but now there's a virtual reality section at the electronic store and there's multiple models and, and uh, uh, different improvements. And a lot of people use virtual reality every day. I use it all the time, especially this past year. Uh, I've been using it to uh, keep in touch with my friends and family uh, by hanging out in like a virtual living room, uh, using big screen and watching movies together and playing board games and stuff. So um, it's a lot of it's not science fiction uh, uh, anymore. Uh, and so that's why when I sat down to write Ready Player Two, I knew that I wanted to involve the technology that was used to access the Oasis. Um, uh, I wanted to do that anyhow, because I could see that that's where virtual reality technology is, is going. We already have um, a lot of what was predicted in Ready Player One. We have, hap there are haptic gloves and haptic suits. They're real expensive and they're, you know, kind of clunky prototypes, but they'll get better fast. And uh, I think much faster than 25 years. Um, and so trying to picture again from, from where we are in 2020, uh, uh, where we're going to be in 25 years, it's um, it's always tricky. You always I tried to undershoot, you know, uh, things with Ready Player One, uh, but I ended up being you know too conservative because it all a lot of it happened more more quickly uh, than I anticipated. But I think the same thing might be the case with the brain computer interface, which that's the one spoiler I will uh, uh, reveal uh, is the technology is uh, the upgrade uh, that. Um, uh, uh, that I apply is explores um, the BCI, and uh, that's something that's already being developed um, right now. They are doing human trials uh, um, uh, on a brain computer interface, and I think that's the last computer interface that humans will ever need to create. Uh, and the last, it's the end uh, evolution point of video games and virtual reality, uh, because once you can make a simulation that is indistinguishable uh, from reality, then it doesn't need to get any better than that. Like that's as good as it can be if you can't tell the difference, you know, and it looks and feels and tastes and smells like reality, um, which was, you know, I played with different devices like uh, olfactory smell tower and things like that that could let you smell things in, in the Oasis. But, um, uh, but I can see now that once you have a brain computer interface, you don't need all these different devices to trick your senses uh, into feeling the environment of the Oasis. Uh, once you plug right into the old noodle, then, you know, it's like the Matrix or Brainstorm or Strange Days or, um, uh, you know, Neuromancer. There's lots of uh, different science fiction that touches on the brain computer interface and the applications of that technology. But now that it's starting to come true, um, I wanted to explore that and see, you know, how that that kind of upgrade would would uh, would would play out. Um, but uh, but yeah, as far as being prescient, you know, I, um, I joke that sometimes I wonder if in 2020, all you need to be prescient is just to be pessimistic and assume bad things right. are going to happen. And then, you know, because they, they, they seem to, but, um, but I'm hoping, you know, that I'm not, uh, um, uh, not that prescient. I really don't want the, uh, I don't want to end up living in the same world that, uh, the characters in Ready Player One do. Uh, um, at all, and I don't want my kids to grow up in that world. Uh, it's a fun uh, setting for uh, for science fiction, but um, uh, I want I want uh, reality to be um, a much more pleasant place for my kids to grow up with. So to grow up in. So uh, uh, hopefully, hopefully, uh, it's a fun action adventure story, but also a cautionary <laughs> cautionary tale. Uh, not that anybody needs to be cautioned anymore uh, about climate change or. Um, or the dangers of uh, technology uh, and sure. the internet and social media and the way that that could, the sociological effects of that, like we're living it, you know, we're seeing, um, uh, we're seeing all that uh, play out. So it is, a, I think, a challenging time to, to be a science fiction writer. Uh, but I, I, I welcome the challenge, Michael. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, and it's interesting because a lot of this you've mentioned, but you know, over the, the decade now, which, I mean, I don't know, it, it doesn't it doesn't feel that long in one way, and then on the other way, it feels like so long since Ready Player One came out. Um, a lot of the things you wrote about have inspired, uh, you know, technology and uh, video games and sort of the idea of the connected virtual world 
Um, and we're talking about, especially in 2020, how many people are interacting, you know, by, by need, but now it's becoming kind of a, a new normal way for to socialize, or like you were saying, like play games or, you know, the holidays, like Zoom holidays, everyone, you know, when we, we started doing virtual events, I, I remember talking to an octogenarian and I was like, oh, it's on this platform called Zoom. She's like, oh, I have Zoom, you know, so it's, you know, whereas last you know, this time last year, it would have been, it would have been, the, you know, far fewer. Um, and, you know, it, like you think about it, Fortnite, you're talking about Roblox or big screen. Um, and I'll, I'll mention sort of the, the, there's a giant Ready Player Two Roblox thing tomorrow that I'll, I'll address as well, which is, which is amazing when you just look at some of the numbers on that. Yeah. Um, in Ready Player Two, you envision a future sort of further changed by VR technology and you explore its impact kind of good and, ba and bad um can you talk a little about you know your thoughts on this you, you you touched on it a little bit you know without going too deep into actual plot points like yeah what, what were you sort of like working on this um well uh as far as um yeah the the effects of the up uh the upgrade to virtual reality i was you know i was surprised that they were already doing human trials, uh, you know, there have, over the past, I want to say 15 years, there have been lots of advances, uh, uh, mostly with medical applications uh, to the brain computer interface. Um, uh, and also there are blind people that can now see in a limited way with like a gla cameras mounted on their glasses and then the, the output of the cameras wired right into their uh, visual cortex. Like that's already happened, you know, uh, years ago. Uh, and it's getting improved all the time. Same with the cochlear implant. And there are also people with um, uh, missing limbs that are able to control uh, prosthetic replacement, robotic replacements uh, through with impulses from their brain. And all of this is happening right now in, in 2020. So if you take that in and imagine uh, how it could be advanced over the next 25 years, um, that it could be something you know, um, getting a brain computer interface could be like LASIK surgery, something that you can go do in a strip mall in a half an hour, you know, but would people, you know, would people do it if it was, you know, elective, elective brain surgery? Uh, uh, and if the, uh, um, if the benefits were, were high enough, I think people would, well, there are already people submitting for these human trials to try it out. Uh, so I think, um, I think it's something that, uh, again, will We'll get to see in our lifetime. I feel so lucky to have been born at the time that I was uh, in 1972. I'm dating myself, uh, but the uh, I was you know I was I was released the same year that Pong <laughs> was released. I was born the yeah. same year that like Pong uh, showed up in arcades, and uh, and so I got to be part of the first generation to have video games. Period. Yeah, and I'm 75. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know well, a lot of this stuff's encoded in our DNA. We were the first generation to have video games, yeah. period, and to have video games at home that we could play over and over again. Um, and we got to see it evolve from, you know, uh, the Atari 2600 and Pong to, you know, the latest Xbox and PlayStation, where it's gone from, you know, blocky pixels on a screen to photorealistic virtual reality now. Um, uh, all just in the space of, you know, uh, 40, 40 years or so. Um, and so uh, imagining another... Uh, uh, 25 years added onto that, it's easy to see it's going to reach an end point where we can, you know, um, it'll be like the matrix. Uh, and my thought, you know, I love the matrix trilogy. I'm excited for the new one that they're, they're, they're shooting right now. But I was, uh, my thought watching those films was always, you know, that the machines, if you could create a simulation that was that realistic, uh, um, you wouldn't need to enslave humans. Humans would willingly emigrate into this virtual world in mass to escape the, the real world, especially as the real world, you know, got worse and climate change uh, increased. So that was my that was my thought with uh, with um, uh, Ready Player One, and uh, kind of revisited revisited that idea um, and how you could maybe uh, like Wade, you know, starts to get a handle, I think, on his Oasis addiction uh, and learns, you know, uh, learns to start to get a handle on it in Ready Player One. But this upgrade throws him. For a loop, which I think it would a lot of people, you know, because it's qualitatively different than playing a video game when, you know, if you play the play the the, the video game or experience this the virtual reality simulation and you can't tell you couldn't tell the difference uh, between it and reality. Um, I think that that will be a, a game changer in a lot of exciting, but also dangerous ways. So those are all things I wanted to um, uh, 
uh, have happened to the characters and have them experience that because that's for me that's you know the fun of science fiction is taking the current technology and where we are technologically and then extrapolating into the future and then imagining um, how the future versions of the technology that we have are going to affect our day to day day to day lives and how we interact with each other. Um, that's what's uh, fun about telling stories like this for me. And you, you already mentioned that you uh, and your family are hanging out in big screen and playing games and watching movies and stuff. Yeah. Um, is this kind of a product of this year or is this something that you, the VR is something that you've are always, you know, kind of had to some level of socialization? In? I, you know, I was lucky because I had written Ready Player One right at the same time that they were starting to develop the Oculus Rift. Um, uh, they took inspiration from Ready Player One and they invited me to come to uh, Oculus headquarters and do a book signing. And then that was when they told me that they gave out new copies of the book to everyone who got hired at Oculus uh, in the wow. early days. This is before they got bought out by Facebook, uh, just to serve as inspiration for them. And that they also had um, a, uh, a conference room. They had different con conference rooms at Oculus. One was named the Oasis. One was named the Metaverse. Uh, the other one was named the Matrix. So. Um, uh, they definitely took uh, took uh, inspiration from Ready Player One, and, and even as far as design features, like having the Oculus Home, like an offline environment that you appear in when you first log in, that is connected to the rest of the internet. That was something that I envisioned for Wade in Ready Player One, and now it's that's that's how they built it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's really uh, it's really exciting and and flattering uh, to have the people who are smart enough to actually build stuff. Uh, take inspiration from me just spitballing, you know, because it's so much easier to just sit at your keyboard and imagine uh, cool technology. But the people who actually, I'm in awe of the people who actually sit down and figure out how to uh, make it a, a reality. Um, but so since the very first uh, early days, I, I got the Oculus DK1 uh, uh, kind of early developer uh, developer kit uh, prototype, and then each version subsequent they sent to me. And, and uh, then this past year, once, you know, uh, quarantine, uh, 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 my family and all my friends went into quarantine. Uh, I started buying the new Oculus Quest, which is like wireless uh, headset um, uh, for all my friends and family, just specifically so that they could, so I could get together and hang out with them in a virtual space. Since I couldn't see them um, uh, in person, um, uh, that's been a huge, a huge boon. My wife and I, we had our, we couldn't have a wedding anniversary party, so we had one in big screen with, you know, like. Uh, 10 of our friends from, you know, all over the country, different time zones, all logged in at once. And you're able to hang out in a virtual living room. And we showed a video of our uh, wedding and pictures, you know, and we're able to spend time together. Actually, it feels different than a Zoom call being in virtual reality, someone because you're in a shared virtual space and, and uh, it really feels like you, like you uh, hung out together. So uh, I've been using it to keep in touch with friends who, you know, uh, uh, live in other parts of the country uh, for years. But this past year it is when it became like a weekly, a weekly thing, you know, like my one social <laughs> interaction with my friends and everybody else is kind of longing for it too. Everybody else misses uh, uh, hanging out. And so um, uh, I, I look forward to that, you know, and I, uh, uh, we're going to do, we're going to do, um, I was so enamored of big screen and use it so much that I, we, that I reached out to the founder of big screen. Uh, and uh, that's uh, uh, how that led to the event that we're doing in big screen, like a, a book talk with avatars. You're going to see my, my big screen avatar that I use to hang out with my friends is also what I use for the, for the uh, big screen talk. And big screen is amazing because it's a uh, virtual cinema software that not only lets you hang out in a private living room, private cinema with your friends or multiple different environments that you can pick, but uh, it also lets you buy tickets to real movies, uh, some of them in 3D and watching 3D movies right. in, in the Oculus is amazing. You don't need glasses because it's all done inside the headset. And uh, so you can buy tickets and be in a virtual audience and hear people reacting like laughing or gasping uh and it's all spatial so people closer to you are louder and people further away and it really you know for 2020 it's amazing and it simulates you know uh the feeling of being in a movie theater you know which a lot of us <laughs> most of us can't be in right now uh, and gives you that communal uh feeling of watching a movie with a bunch of strangers which i really really miss uh this past year is one of the things i, I miss the most so um even I, as the author of Ready Player One, have been turning to <laughs> virtual reality to uh, uh, and using it in these you know exact ways, which is something that I never imagined. You know, I didn't think that I didn't know that if we would ever get virtual reality, or if, you know, uh, it would happen 
far in the future. So I feel really, I feel really uh, grateful to have it, especially this past year. So uh, kind of switching gears a little bit, uh, Ready Player One has, is, is also, you know, very much, you know, it's a technological story, but it's a story about Wade and it's a story about like, you know, being, um, being that, you know, the geek, being the nerd a little bit, but it has a love story too. Um, and that story, uh, for, you know, again, it's not a spoiler, uh, continues in, in Ready Player Two. Um, and in the second, we see the re realities of the relationship. Um, we see different worldviews, uh, you know, and that love it isn't a sort of magical bomb, magical salve for, for all problems. Um, and many young people will, will no doubt learn, you know, kind of through these characters. And, um, and, and that was honestly like something that was really fascinating about Ready Player One was that I, you know, naively at first assumed that you would have to know all the references to get, to get it. And we had so many kids, even like on a paperback event we did with you, how many kids were coming through the line? And I would talk to you and I'd be like, so what is it about this book? You know, and it's the characters and some things they know from their parents, but you know, the, the sort of love story and seeing themselves in Wade and seeing themselves in the different characters. Um, so what are some of the books and movies that had kind of relationships in it that you learned as, as a young person, um, you know, maybe aside from Six and Candles? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and was it important for you to, you know, kind of uh, complicate the relationships from Ready Player One in Ready Player Two? Sort of a lot there, sorry. Uh, yes, there's a lot there. There were a lot of books uh, that um, uh, inspired me uh, growing up. I kind of learned, you know, I grew up in this really small town, uh, 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 Ashland, Ohio. And uh, in the 80s, you know, we didn't have the internet and uh, we didn't have MTV, I remember, because all the local churches boycotted MTV because it was playing the devil's music. So we had to smuggle MTV tapes in from Mansfield. That was, that was the sa same uh, of my town in Western New York. There was one oh, yeah. woman who owned the cable company and we never had MTV. So we would get like tapes. A friend of mine would like go to his family in Cleveland and bring back 120 minutes. Yeah. Tape, you know, I was, I was how it was in Ashland too. Like tapes of Headbangers Ball were like, you know, yeah. bootleg <laughs> copies from out, from out, out of town. But, um, but that was really the only, the uh, uh, way the outside world reached me was through media. You know, uh, I didn't, uh, I never, I don't think we traveled outside of Ohio too much uh, until I was an adult. So I felt kind of, uh, you know, trapped there and, uh, and would only have a window to the world um, uh, through movies and television and books. And so uh, that was kind of how I learned about the world uh, was, was through media before I, before I uh, got out there. But um, the, the, you know, and I devoured all kinds of books, not just science fiction when I was a kid. I read all of Judy Bloom's books, uh, uh, but I also loved um, uh, Tolkien and I loved uh, um, uh, William Gibson's Sprawl trilogy it was hugely influential. And uh, one of the things that made me want to write science fiction, Snow Crash uh, is a book I always recommend. Uh, it's my, probably my favorite. I love Neil Stevenson's work, but that's mm -hmm. probably still my favorite, uh, Neil Stevenson, that and the, and the Diamond Age. Um, uh, and then Kurt Vonnegut. Kurt Vonnegut was probably my favorite author, and I just read everything uh, that he uh, published, uh, all his short stories. One of his short stories is uh, uh, quoted in um, Ready Player Two is the epigraph, uh, Unready to Wear, uh, which is uh, um, uh, one of my favorite short stories and, and one of the inspirations behind uh, Ready Player Two. So a lot of different, um, uh, a lot of different writers uh, uh, inspired me growing up. Another Ohioan, James Thurber. I was a big James Thurber. Yeah. fan too uh all those stories about uh his dogs uh i loved but um uh and I, what was the second part of your question was just kind of uh what was it important for you when you took a look at how you had left a lot of the relationships at the end yeah. of ready player one to sort of uh dig in and ready complicated player. well i knew just from my own life you know that relationships are complicated and when you're 19 or 20 like uh, you are not, you know, for me anyway, you're not the person that you're going to become quite yet. You know, uh, you, most people aren't, you're on the way, you're still learning, you know, you're still learning, um, uh, uh about the world and about relationships. And, um, and some people are lucky and meet their true love, uh, right out of the gate, but most people go through multiple relationships and because they're, because they're, uh, learning to how, how to be a good partner, 
uh, in a relationship. And Wade, you know, uh, Wade has never, uh, I think, you know, he, he and Artemis kiss for the very first time at the end of the uh, first book and they meet in person, you know, spoiler, if you haven't read the first book, you, uh, uh, but you, um, uh, so I knew that, you know, even as I finished that story, I'm like, well, you know, things, you know, that's going to be a complicated relationship and uh, a bumpy ride uh, for both of them because now they have to learn to see if they have chemistry in the real world uh, because every their whole relationship up to that point has been through the filter of the internet and through the filter of, of the Oasis. And that's something I've uh, seen play out, you know, in my friends' uh, lives all through, you know, uh, even in back in the 90s, you know, I would, uh, when I was working tech support, I would see people working beside me who played... EverQuest all day or World of Warcraft and had really strong, serious, tight relationships with people that they met, you know, uh, through these avatars, people that they adventured with every night. And in some ways, their life inside the MMO was, you know, more important to them than their real life, uh, which they just, you know, they worked a job all day and would gold farm while they were doing tech support. But, you know, they lived in service of this life that they had in a virtual world. And people also would fall in love in these uh, virtual worlds and then go and, uh, you know, I would see friends fly to another city, you know, uh, to meet somebody that they'd never met, uh, but had got grown close to online to see if the relationship would work. And sometimes it would, and sometimes it wouldn't because the filter of the internet had been, uh, removed. So, um, that was something that I knew would, uh, would have complicated, um, Samantha and Wade's relationship, uh, uh, from the beginning, but then added to which they have basically just become the co-owners of Facebook, you know, uh, of 2045, uh, yeah. or Twitter, or, you know, um, uh, all, all the social media platforms combined, they're in control of the most powerful uh, company in the world and have very different ideas about At how- the same time that they're meeting for the first time, you know, yeah, right yeah. at the same time. So, so I knew that they were, you know, they were in for a bumpy ride and also just their philosophical differences, you know, which kind of come out in their first conversation when they're talking about what they would do if they won the contest. Right. Um, yeah, and I think they're both being honest in that conversation. And then in Ready Player Two, you see they both follow through on you know uh, what they were, uh, what their dream was if they won. Uh, and um, uh, and even that is something that they still still disagree over. So I wanted to be honest about you know I didn't think that um, uh, that it would just be all hunky dory and happily ever after for them. I knew that it would be uh, there would be complications in their relationship. And then once I sat down to Right, Ready Player Two, I discovered along, you know, uh, as I was, I discovered what those would be as I, you know, told the story. And uh, um, I worked on a, little, a long time, and especially the, the conversations between um, Parzival and Artemis, Wade and Samantha, uh, because they really, you know, they, they um, speak for two sides of the, of the argument about uh, this, this technology, but the same with the Oasis, you know, they, uh, she was kind of using the Oasis he was using the Oasis as an escape because it was the world that he preferred to the real world where she was using it as a way to make reality. She wanted to win the contest so she could get the money to make reality uh, better. Um, and so uh, just that difference in their worldview and in their goals, uh, you see that play out in Ready Player Two. Hmm. So obviously, uh, you know, and, and maybe, maybe some of the people here um, learned about Ready Player One through the film. Um, yes which was a huge success um, and was directed by Steven Spielberg. And I remember talking to you at the, the book event um, about writing a book that could never be made into a movie. Um, and just the sheer number of licensing things. And, uh, yeah. but it was, it was written by someone uh, who heavily influenced the book uh, with you, uh, the both of you, uh, Steven Spielberg, and you wrote the movie. What was what was it like having your debut novel turned into a movie, uh, especially a movie that directed by Steven Spielberg that you co-wrote with Steven Spielberg? Um, and what was that? What was that whole journey like? Uh, it was crazy. It was you know I slowly began to question if my life was a simulation. I was like, there's no way <laughs> this is happening. Um, but. Uh, well, the story I was telling initially when they told me he was reading it, I, you know, I, I believe that <laughs> I believe he was reading it, but I didn't believe he was going to um, uh, actually decide to direct it uh, because I'm sure he gets sent everything. I'm like, oh, well, they're looking at all these big directors and, you know, uh, it's just, 
it's something that will pass over his desk and he probably won't ever read. But, uh, but it was like a two week, it was a two week waiting period while I heard he was reading it. And then we were waiting to see what he, uh, decided. And it was like the longest two weeks of my life. And I actually got more and more depressed, um, as it went on because I'm like, well, you know, he's going to say no. And now I'm going to have to spend the whole rest of my life imagining what it would have been like if Steven Spielberg had directed Ready Player One, um, which I was not looking forward to because I, you know, uh, I could imagine how amazing it would be. But luckily that didn't happen. Luckily he decided to do it, a uh, miracle of miracles. And, uh, and so I got to have that experience. And I, a lot of people know I, my first movie that I made, Fanboys, uh, there was amazing elements to that experience. That was incredible. You know, we had uh, made, I got to make a Star Wars movie uh, and it has Princess Leia and Lando and Darth Maul are in it. And we, you know, shot at Skywalker Ranch. I got to go to Skywalker Ranch and uh, Skywalker's sound and do the sound mix. Um, uh, I always joke, I'm the only Star Wars fan in history who ever broke into Skywalker Ranch by writing a movie about breaking into Skywalker Ranch, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> which what was amazing. But the, you know, the release after that movie uh, uh, was finished, it sat in the can for like two years and there was uh, reshoots. Uh, that the, you know, uh, I, the original writer and director didn't approve of. And it was, you know, it was the Weinstein company and it was, uh, <laughs> uh, it was, it was a bad experience. So I, you know, that was actually what motivated me to want to try uh, writing fiction because the experience of being a screenwriter showed me that you um, don't have control of your characters when you write a film oftentimes. And it, uh, uh, and the whole story can kind of get taken away from you uh, through the process of, of it being produced. Um, and altered, you know, characters that were based on me and my friends, you know, were altered by other people and changed in ways that I didn't uh, necessarily like or approve of. Um, so that was, you know, it was a good experience because it motivated me to to work harder and try writing a novel to see what would happen. Um, so, uh, and what happened was what, you know, everything you could possibly want <laughs> to happen uh, when I published my first novel. So the experience was amazing. It was the, it was it was the opposite of fanboys. The experience of making Ready Player One was just wonderful. And what I think every screenwriter, especially every novelist who has their work adapted, you know, uh, uh, would hope would happen. He's so kind to writers. And I think that's part of his success as uh, he's a writer himself. And uh, he's written some of my most, you know, my, some of my favorite movies. Uh, he wrote Close Encounters. He wrote the screenplay for Close Encounters. He wrote the final draft of the screenplay for AI, uh, which he, he let me read. He's, you know, uh, he's a really uh, uh, creative person, but also very kind. And uh, uh, to both Zach uh, Penn and I, who's the other screenwriter, we just both had a great uh, experience working with him. So I assumed, you know, and once I was on the set, you know, and I'm seeing, you know, my characters that I created being directed by Steven Spielberg, played by these amazing actors, and, uh, and just seeing the whole world that I had imagined. Like they had engineers come out and and build the stacks for real they built i think four or five real stacks it was digitally extended in the movie but they built it for real tall enough that you could see it you know from the highway when you're driving to the studio people would see the stacks had become this feature on the on the london skyline so it was just uh it was just incredible from from beginning to end all the way through the release we you know even the the release date of the movie um uh we star wars um, took our, uh, I think it was The Last Jedi or uh, one of the Star Wars films took our, our uh, release date in December of 2017. So they had to move the release date uh, and they moved it to my birthday, to my uh, 46th birthday. So on my 46th birthday, my Steven Spielberg movie uh, uh, came out and we actually got to premiere it here at South by Southwest in Austin in my hometown. And so the whole cast and crew and Steven and everybody came to my hometown and they built they built the stacks again for real downtown as uh, like a, a art installation uh, with a, like a life size iron giant. It was crazy. The whole thing was just you know. Uh, uh, and after it was over, I was like, well, it's all downhill from here. What could ever <laughs> what could ever top this uh, experience? Um, so I'm sure other nice things uh, will happen to me in my life. And uh, but I just assumed that that was the that was the <laughs> pinnacle because it's just such a wonderful uh, wonderful experience all the way through. How many times did you leave your script for the sequel to Buckaroo? Uh, <laughs> Banzai. Pia Banzai just a, on, on his desk or near his chair accidentally. <laughs> I, I, I did not, uh, you know, but I think I might have introduced Steven Spielberg to Buckaroo Banzai. I don't know if he saw that when it first uh, uh, came out, but, uh, but now he's, you know, now he's a fan of it. The, um, the, uh, 
um, uh, I was excited Kevin Smith was going to make Buckaroo Banzai TV yeah. series for a while. Uh, but uh, uh, so I sent that script to him because uh, I thought I would love. Did you have to pay for it again? Uh, the comic yeah, book no, shop or whatever? <laughs> <laughs> that was, yeah, that was a funny story that I went to. A, uh, that was the first thing of uh, first writing of mine that I ever found for sale in a comic book shop was my screenplay. Uh, I, for people watching who don't know, I wrote a fan script for the uh, promised sequel to Buckaroo Banzai, Buckaroo Banzai Against the World Crime League, which never got produced. But I'm such a huge Buckaroo Banzai nerd. Uh, and that was like an early writing exercise for me. I was teaching myself to write screenplays. And every time I would watch that movie, it would end in disappointment because they would promise the sequel that I knew was never going to get made. So I decided to write it myself. And it was so much, I had so much fun. Uh, uh, now I know that that's called uh, writing a, a script on spec. Uh, but I, uh, back, you know, uh, back then it was just pure uh, fan script uh, that I wrote uh, for fun. And so... Um, it's, you know, uh, and again, that is crazy. The success of that and people digging that script that I just put on the internet for free, you know, built my confidence as a writer and, and inspired me to keep writing and write my own original screenplay. So, uh, I'm not embarrassed about the Buck Rubens I script because it was a, it was a, it was a, one of the stepping stones on my path to becoming a, a full-time writer was, um, seeing all these other Buck Rubines, I fans really love it. A lot of people thought it was the real sequel script. They're like, oh, I can't wait for this to get made. And I had to like disappoint them. They're like, no, this is just something that I wrote for fun. I don't think it'll ever, uh, ever get made. But that, you know, uh, it, it taught me a lot about screenwriting and then led to me writing Fanboys, which then led to me writing Ready Player One. So it's good. So I, I guess you like one question with, with so much entertainment that's available today, you know, like you talked about like smuggling tapes in Ashland, or I was explaining to my 11 year old daughter um, what blockbusters were and video rental stores and how things would be out. You'd be excited to go get something and it would just be out. And yeah. so now it's like everything is streaming. Everything is right there even like having to wait a week in between episodes of the Mandalorian seems outrageous. Like, what are you doing? Um, but with everything, like just right at our fingertips today, do you think like, you know, our collective uh, relationship with pop culture has changed? And do you think, you know, it seems like people are still bonding with individual things. Like my daughter's a huge Totoro fan. Oh my God. Um, but you know, like what do, do you think that people are bonding as intensely as say we did? um you know to to individual movies books etc when basically the entire history of culture is available you know in our pockets yeah well i think it's maybe uh um the hunt isn't as much fun like the hunt for rare stuff and having to order things through the mail or you know i remember like uh getting like pal vhs converters to watch you know tapes that were from overseas and uh same with uh, Nintendo uh, Famicom converters being able to play like uh, uh, Nintendo games that were only released in Japan things like that was like fun and part of like I think being a geek in the 80s but I don't think that you know uh, I think maybe that you know this next generation has easier access uh, to stuff but there's a lot more I think for them to wade through to find the the, the gems but uh, there, I think there's always going to be geeks and uh, people who geek out uh, or uh, enthusiasts, as I call it, people who get, you know, uh, so enamored of something, then they want to know everything about it. You know, like that's what I love about The Mandalorian. It's introducing a whole new generation to Star Wars uh, and they can go down the Star Wars rabbit hole and explore all the different, you know, uh, animated and uh, uh, iterations of it and films and the whole, the lore. And it's all as deep as you, uh, as you, as you want to go. So I think that maybe people's relationship, it's not, you know, it's not physical. Uh, it's not physical items like VHS tapes and uh, record albums anymore, but um, it's still, you know, it's easier maybe to seek these things out, but I think the human reaction to it and the enthusiasm is still the, still the same. And what I hope never changes is the way that like a love, a shared love of some facet of pop culture, like binds, binds people together and connects you uh, with your friends, but also people that you don't even know, you know, like if, uh, if you're at a party back when we would go to parties um, uh, and somebody makes a reference to your, one of your favorite films or, uh, one of your favorite TV shows, then that's like a connection between the two of you. And you can, you know, you have your own private language, you know, if you love Dr. Who or you love Harry Potter or whatever it is you love, you, you know, uh, uh, it can connect you with somebody that you don't know. Cause you have this shared thing, um, 
in your past that also affected you deeply and affected this other person enough for them to, you know, uh, make it part of their lexicon. So uh, I love that. And I think that's one of the, um, that's one of the best things about art and pop culture, you know, which pop culture is just a collection of popular art uh, and television shows and movies and books. Um, that's, you know, in my mind, one of the purposes of art is to uh, let people know that they're not alone. Um, you, like if you hear a song that, you know, uh, really captures the way that you felt at a certain time in your uh, life, then it makes you feel better about that. You know, I wasn't the only person who's gone through something like that. And if you, you know, you can get that from a film or a book or, uh, or anything. And if you, you know, you see a character that you recognize, you're like, oh, I'm just like that. You know, that's how I talk with my friends. Uh, it makes you feel less alone. It makes you, you know, uh, uh, feel better about your life. And that's what I, you know, uh, uh, I always love that in art. And I love it. Uh, I love it in movies when characters uh, uh, or in, in books when characters reference a film or a television show I've seen or a book that I've read. Um, uh, then it makes me feel like I'm in the same world, the same universe as these characters and that they're, you know, it's a connection with their life. So uh, those, that's, you know, uh, for me, just pop culture and, and uh, um, different movies and books and video games, all of that is, you know, stuff from my life that is also from everyone's life. Everyone who's been alive on the planet the last, you know, uh, uh, four or five decades has experienced some of the same stuff that I have. So those are all like paints on my palette, you know, when I'm writing things, you know, things that occur to me, the way that you, I, I don't make a list of things to weave into the story. I, uh, you know, I try to include them organically the way you do in a conversation based on what's happening in the, in, in the story. Um, so, uh, so I don't know, I don't think the relationship, our relationship with, uh, with pop culture and like our passion for it, uh, people's passion for it has changed, but maybe just the, uh, the delivery system mm. has changed, but you can't get everything on streaming. I found, I was, we were trying to find cocoon the other night. Can't get cocoon guys. Go look, go look. You can't get it. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta buy it on VHS. Uh, yeah. So let's throw the entire <laughs> system out. Like if you're not going to have cocoon, like what's the, what's the point? Like get, I can't rid, get, of cocoon, get rid of it. But I don't, I don't have everything. So that, so the people who have cocoon and VHS or laser disc or DVD, they're feeling satisfied because they've got it all. <laughs> Yeah, especially the Laserdisc players. So like, I knew I should have hold on to this. They're frantically Googling your address. You're going to get 17 copies of Cocoon on Laserdisc. <laughs> week, so I'll good. tell you, that was what my friend Derek, my friend uh, Derek Brown, the poet, He uh, that was his recommendation uh, for what I should pitch to Steven Spielberg. He's like, you should pitch him a, a sequel that combines it's a sequel to Cocoon and it's a sequel to Goonies and it's called Cocoonies. Cocoonies. So I, did not, I did not pass on the suggestion of Cocoonies. So. Yeah, my I just introduced my daughter to Goonies. And Goonies. I was, it's kind of one of those things where you're like, please, oh, please, oh, please. And she loved it. So I'm like, okay, all right, all right, cool. That was one of my best uh, moments with Steven Spielberg uh, when we were uh, we're doing press in London for, for Ready Player One. And we were, uh, uh, we were doing an interview together. And, um, and I talked about how much Goonies, you know, meant to me uh, growing up. And that the characters, you know, uh, uh, in Ready Player One, are a lot like the Goonies. There's like this misfit band of uh, characters get together and they're trying to save their neighborhood, just, you know, but their neighborhood is the, is the oasis. Um, right. And it's, you know, uh, it's a real, uh, there's a lot, a lot of ways in which his, his stories and stories that he, and that's a story based on his own childhood and the group of misfits that he uh, grew up with. So uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of ways that his, uh, his early filmmaking uh, shaped my storytelling sensibilities. So I want to kind of get into, before it gets too late, um, we can't keep you forever. Um, the publisher told me I can't. Uh, so I want to get into some of the uh, questions. Obviously, we, we got hundreds of questions sent. Some of these have been cobbled together. Some I just took one. So, uh, I, you know, I apologize. Thank you, everyone, for submitting questions. Um, Thank they you were great. Uh, so just kind of to start with, um, with all of the wonderful and this kind of parlays into, or not parlays, but segues into uh, what you were just talking about. With all of the wonderful 80s references, this is from Heather Boyer uh, in Ready Player One. I know it's hard, but do you have a favorite 80s movie or a collection of 80s movies? Oh, um, that is hard. Uh, uh, yeah, I have a collection of 80s movies that are my favorite. It would be hard to narrow them down. But Banzai is one that I've seen over and over again. Uh, but, uh, recently, 
uh, I rediscovered one of my favorite '80s movies uh, when I showed it to my daughter, and uh, it's Three O'clock High. You ever see Three O'clock High? Yeah, sure. Oh, Three O'clock High, guys. It's not not classic. in not in probably twenty years, but oh, it's uh, it's a forgotten classic, and uh, and a secret Amblin movie. Amblin and Steven uh, Spielberg actually uh, were producers on that film, but uncredited. But you can you can you can feel the presence uh, in that, and uh, it's one of my it's one of my all time favorites. But I I you know I. Um, uh, uh, I will do on my, uh, when I do a streaming search, I will sometimes search just by year. I'll put in like 1987 and just see what comes up, what was released uh, last year. That's something that you can uh, do now. But man, it was, for me, that was just such a golden age of cinema. And when you add the nostalgia factor of, you know, films that uh, I grew up watching uh, when I lived in Ohio and, uh, and the, uh, you know, all the memories associated with seeing those films. It's just, that's, uh, it's a double, double whammy for me. I still, I still love to revisit. I've been revisiting a lot of 80, 80s movies this year since there are no new movies <laughs> coming out. So. Right. Yeah. Bill and yeah. Ted. Bill and Ted. Ah, it was such a great, such a great sequel. I, I love like, those. I love those we got Ready Player Two. We got Bill and Ted Three. I mean, it's not all bad. It's not all bad. I'm not so all, uh, proud of those bad. guys. That was such a great, uh, such a great sequel, and the kind of sequel that you want, you know. And with like a 20, 20 year gap, I think twenty five year gap between uh, sequels, and uh, they had a reference to Station from Bogus Journey, so I was happy that yeah, Station, Station. Station. Um, from Keith Howell, uh, did the writing of Ready Player One movie and working with Steel Spielberg inform your writing on Ready Player Two in any way, and if so, how? You've touched on it a little bit, but yeah, more, that's more of kind of a process question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I tried uh, uh, not to let it to, uh, not to let it, uh, uh, that when I sat down, I'm, you know, uh, uh, the only thing in my mind was to write a sequel to my book and kind of purge all thoughts of the movie <laughs> from my mind and, you know, pick the characters back up uh, where I left them. But there were, you know, making the movie was a, a big part of a couple of years of my life. And, um, and I learned a lot about telling stories and about making movies um, during that time. So it was impossible for it not to influence me in some ways. And I will, you know, um, uh, but uh, I never took, you know, I, I never uh, took any of the changes that we made for uh, purposes of the movie and then um, adopted them for the, I try right. to keep the two universes separate. But the one, one way in which the, um, uh, uh, experience to make in the movie influenced Ready Player Two was uh, the soundtrack. Uh, specifically, Steven uh, picked a uh, uh, a song for the first scene where uh, Parzival and Artemis are hanging out in um, in the film in uh, H's workshop, and when they see the Iron Giant under construction for the first time, and uh, it's a Prince song um, uh, that I remember arguing with him about. You know, or trying to suggest other songs because it was a song from the seventies. Called "I Want to Be Your Lover" from from uh, one of Prince's first albums, and I was pushing for something from uh, maybe <laughs> uh, something from the '80s, uh, but he uh, he wouldn't back down. And now I can't picture any other song in that scene. But but he um, him picking that song and and uh, kind of having the idea that that H would be a Prince fan, uh, mm -hmm. which I also discovered the actress uh, Lena. Waith, who I adore uh, and thought was amazing. She uh, is a big Prince fan. And so that was one thing from the experience that making the movie uh, that uh, uh, inspired the something in the story. I don't want to spoil anything, but I don't think it spoils too much to say there's a Prince reference or two. <laughs> uh, but that was something that I took from, um, uh, from the experience of making, making the movie uh, that just, I think, made the world more rich. But so that's uh, that's, that's, that's one thing. Uh, but I really did my best to, you know, like I had kind of a, an Ian Malcolm from Jurassic world situation where, uh, you know, there is, and also my friend George R. R. Martin had that problem where they're in the adaptation, there are characters that are alive in the TV series, but dead in the books and vice versa. And, um, I had that with one character who's kind of alive in the, uh, alive in the, um, uh, movie, but not in the book. And so, like I said, I just ignored, uh, I ignored all the changes from the movie and, um, uh, and just picked up where the, where the book left off. So hopefully I answered your question. Yeah. So a lot of people, and I sort of alluded to this, a lot of people, uh, wrote in, 
the, the car's going off. Yeah, there's more lights flashing. I turned my flex display. I, I think my battery's yeah. running low for my flex bands. So I had to convert to, I had to switch to alternate backup power. Nice. Um, how did your life in Ohio influence your work? Ah, in every possible way. Um, you know, I am a, a Buckeye through and through. Um, uh, like I said, I grew up in Ashland and never really didn't get out of Ohio too much uh, my first 18 years. So, uh, uh, and really um, spent like the first two decades of my life just in, in Ohio and, uh, and grew up watching, you know, uh, television out of Cleveland and uh, like Lorraine and, uh, and also Columbus uh, and um, grew up reading Funky Winkerbean. I always loved that Funky Winkerbean was set in Ohio. Remember, yeah, it was a comic strip, um, yeah. and uh, I remember meeting Tom Baddock at a at a comic book convention and telling him how much I loved his his strip. But um, uh, yeah, it's just you know Ohio is like the middle of the country, you know, and uh, and um, Family Ties was like my favorite show, which was set in Columbus. I was you know I, it never occurred to me that I had an accent. Uh, I never had an accent uh, until I moved down to Texas, and people pointed out to me. I'm like, I talk like the people on television. You are the guys down here. You're the ones with an accent. But I think now I might have a little bit of a Texas accent. But um uh but you know I I uh I love growing up in Ohio. I would we would take field trips uh um from Ashland and one of those field trips was to Kosai in Columbus. You ever hear of Kosai? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They rebuilt it a few years ago and had a new instant but I went to the original Kosai on on field trips that was in downtown Columbus and it was across the street from the very first Wendy's that was ever uh, ever existed so the old Kosai was there and I uh, uh, that was the first place I ever saw a DeLorean was at Kosai they had a DeLorean with the wings up in the lobby of Kosai and it was roped off and it was presented as the car of the future and this is like right when it had come out 1982 uh, and uh, that was where my love affair with the DeLorean uh, happened uh, it was the only time I think I ever saw a DeLorean in Ohio was at Kosai, uh, but I, it stuck with me and I'm like, oh, someday if I could ever, you know, uh, if I could ever afford it, that would be the coolest car uh, to have. And now, now I've overdone it. Now I've got two. This, yeah. Well, there was a one, there was a one that was parked in front of our store for a while, but it's gone. Yes. That's this one that it's since <laughs> been all tricked out. Uh, yeah. It's a Ghostbuster one now. That's the you, one had, you had, you had power pack. You had the packs uh, yes. with, with you. Yeah. The proton pack, yes, my proton, proton pack, pack yeah. is up there on the on the wall. You can see it yeah. uh, mounted. But this, uh, you know, I should turn I should turn the kit scanner on. The kit scanner working? Oh wow! But, but the um, uh, this, so I had a contest when Ready Player One came out uh, to give away a DeLorean. One one by one of our our customers. Craig Queen, yeah, yeah, um, yeah that's right. He is um, he. So Craig had the car. He won it by like setting a new world record on joust for the Atari 2600. That was like the final gate in that challenge uh, in the summer of 2012 when, when uh, the paperback came out. So, and he had the car for, I think uh, three or four years, uh, but he had a lot of kids and it's not a practical car and it was taking up his garage. And so he decided to sell it. Uh, and he called me and was like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to sell the car. And uh, I, and I didn't want it to just go to anybody who didn't. And I had driven the car all across the country on my paperback tour. And I knew it was a good car and I had fond memories of it. So I, I'm like, oh, I don't want it to just get auctioned off or sold locally. So I bought it back and, uh, and then gave it to my brother for a while. And he had it for several years. And that was when he uh, uh, is a, uh, had converted. We did a lot of this conversion. And our friend Jamie McShan uh, from like a local R2 uh, builders club helped me build the R2 dome and made it like fully uh, functional. And uh, awesome. so... This car is like a boomerang. I've given it away twice and both people have like given it back to me. So I'm just destined to have, destined to have two, I guess. Destined to have multiple, multiple DeLoreans. Yes. Um, so speaking of, speaking of, uh, you know, that's, that's probably a good pivot. Um, so I was just being told uh, before this um, about, you know, the, the Roblox event that you have um and it uh, so my understanding is and correct me if i'm wrong 10 a.m pacific standard time tomorrow the hunt in roblox begins um yes. and you've done this this q a and i'm just checking uh right now but as of uh the beginning of this event and now it, it's gone up by another hundred thousand over 7.7 7 million people have visited the Ready Player Two hub on Roblox. 
it's crazy. My, uh, my daughter introduced me, my eldest daughter introduced me to Roblox and uh, loved playing it, loved playing it with her friends. And, um, and I got to meet the founder of Roblox at South by Southwest uh, uh, a few years ago when the movie came out. And so, like I said, the first, when, I, when we did the, um, the contest to give away this DeLorean uh, back in the summer of 2012, I was just kind of doing that all myself. I really wanted to have a contest that mirrored the contest in the book, but I had never run something like that before. So uh, I ended up doing it myself and getting some help from a few uh, game designer friends of mine, Mike Micah and Richard Garriott helped me with uh, one of the challenges. Uh, creating an old Atari game uh, that was based on the book and then also a, a, a Facebook collector game. And then the final challenge was to set a, a world record on a video game, which your customer Craig uh, uh, did. So, um, but for this, um, I, uh, so that kind of mirrored the three keys and three gates uh, uh, of Ready Player One. So for Ready Player Two, uh, we wanted to do something um, uh, equally awesome or if not more awesome. And, uh, and luckily I had this uh, uh, we reached out to Roblox and they were, they were into it. They had done an event for the Ready Player One movie uh, on Roblox that was huge uh, and hugely popular. And really like, it was amazing to see, you know, uh, even kids in my own life getting excited about it. Cause it was all these, you know, there's like 30 and I think something like 30 million people log in and play Roblox every day now, yeah, like it dwarfs, uh, dwarfs most of the MMOs. Uh, um, so it's kind of the most popular uh, one of the most popular uh, multiplayer video games and kids can jump into different environments and, and uh, hang out. And you can also buy virtual items and uh, uh, that you can use in, in these different games. It's really, you know, it is really analogous to, to the Oasis um, in a lot of ways. Uh, and has been hugely, I think uh, a huge, let's uh, say life jacket for, for kids this past year who miss spending time with their friends, just still able to kind of get in, uh, like I said, get into a virtual space and hang out and do stuff together and, you know, FaceTime while they're also playing together in Roblox. Uh, it's really uh, great. So I really, I'm excited uh, to do something with them again. And we have, um, we have a, a, a kind of a quest in Roblox that mirrors the quest. It's not exactly the same and the challenges aren't the, the, the same uh, uh, as uh, in Ready Player Two, but if you want the experience, if you were someone who participated at the contest uh, uh, to win the DeLorean first, the first time, this is this is kind of similar. Where it, uh, we have different challenges than in the book, but it kind of um, recreates that communal experience of a bunch of gunters, you know, all trying to solve the same puzzles at the same time to be the ultimate winner. Uh, the good thing about this contest at Roblox is there there can be more than one winner, uh, um, so uh, you've got a good chance of of uh, being being one of them. So yeah, and apparently there's a, a ton of players already running around with their free Ready Player Two t-shirts on. It's crazy. They you could give away virtual items and people are wearing you know virtual Ready Player Two t-shirts. And I went in there and checked it out. It's it's, uh, it's pretty crazy. Um, it's That's amazing. Know, well, yeah, congratulations like, on that. That's amazing. It's it's so cool. Uh, uh, and uh, as somebody who loves video games uh, and loves you know I love video games and especially multiplayer video games and that feeling of you know. Uh, uh, like going, uh, going raiding or going uh, on a quest with your friends in a video game. It's just nothing, nothing, nothing like it. And when there's real world, real world stakes, I remember in the eighties, Atari had a contest that was one of the contests that inspired Ready Player One uh, called Sword Quest. And they had three right. games, the Sword Quest games, and you could win a gold chalice or like a jewel encrusted sword and a crown. Uh, and it, it was just, supposed to be like a bunch of them, but like one didn't happen, right? Yeah, they ended up canceling it, uh, the third one, uh, uh, before it was ever released. But you can read about the Sword Quest contest, and that was like the ultimate. You know, they made these games specially, and they were really difficult uh, puzzles. And like the first kids to, you know, uh, solve these riddles and send it in could, uh, uh, and, you know, kids ended up winning this uh, jewel encrusted sword. One guy had it melted down to get the money, <laughs> the gold, and, and, uh, but uh, uh, it's a real interesting story. But I love, I love that uh, real life video game contest. They don't do them too much anymore. So I'm excited that we I get to do one for Ready Player Two. That's so great. Um, so uh, if you were, this is uh, from um, Brett Gibson. Um, shout out to a fellow Ohio native. If you were in the position of James Holiday, would you model the Oasis after your childhood places? You know, like his home or, and if so, what would be a couple of the fond recreations? Oh yeah, you know I have. Um, uh, uh, that was a great question. Thank you. I have, uh, you know, daydreamed about that while I was writing Ready Player One. 
Um, I'm fascinated, like you could already do it uh, in a limited way. Like now the uh, Google Street View uh, that is, uh, is archived. So you can go back and look at previous Google Street Views from previous years. So now there's like each year, the Google cars drive by and kind of create a visual archive of what every street looks like uh, each year. And so uh, uh, using that information in the future, I think it would be uh, probably pretty easy to take that visual information and then re you know, recreate um, uh, your hometown as you remember in the eighties. You know, I think that's a fun idea for anybody like, cause you're, you go back, there's that, that, you know, that saying, if you can never go home again, because, you know, you change and you also your home changes when you go back, you know, um, uh, it's not quite like you remember. Um, but uh, with virtual reality, you could make it exactly like you remembered and exactly like it was, you know, it's like when you watch old family, you know, home movies that you've never seen, you know, it like, uh, it takes you back. Uh, and I think that would be a fun, I think that would be a fun uh, thing to, to recreate my hometown, uh, Ashland in the, uh, as it was in the eighties, you know, that would just be a nostalgia, nostalgia bomb. So yeah, I think about, uh, you know, uh, but I'll, in some ways too, you know, I'm, uh, I side with Halliday or, Hall, you know, or, or Wade when he's, you know, I was like, I wonder why, you know, how Hall, Halliday didn't have that great of a childhood. Why would he create such a detailed simulation of it? But I think that's part of it. Like we're exercising your demons or, you know, uh, and, and that's how nostalgia works. You end up forgetting, you know, a lot of the negative stuff. And just focusing on you know the 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 positive uh, uh, elements of your past, and so um, hopefully I answer that question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, from Sumit um, my Cower, one. yeah, one. nice. Michael Gary uh, James. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw some like the posters and some of the stuff too. It's uh, amazing back there. Um, how easy or hard was it to get back into the writing process for Ready Player Two? Um, it was, you know, uh, 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 I don't think it was that hard. You know, I was kind of excited, uh, especially, you know, I was excited and kind of filled with all the possibilities because I had seen, you know, I'd seen so many things that I had imagined, like built and realized, you know, uh, in the real world and executed in this uh, 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 amazing way. Uh, and then in, shown in a film that was, you know, seen by people all around the world. Uh, that was, you know, so sitting down to write Ready Player Two, and and I tried not to think about the possibility that that could happen again. But it was, you know, it was still there all the time. Like any, you know, anything, uh, anything that I write could end up, you know, being visualized, and you know, actors could end up uh, um, uh, acting it out, and you know, this could all really happen. Uh, so uh, that was that was really exciting. You know, I don't know that I've ever been in that position, uh, sitting down to write a book before. Um, and uh, uh, so I felt, but I also felt a huge, you know, debt of gratitude to fans of the first book and really wanted to, um, uh, you know, I knew if they were going to sit down to read Ready Player Two, I wanted them to, as best I could, give them the same, you know, fun action adventure treasure hunt experience that they had with the first book, which is a tall order, you know, because uh, the first time it was a surprise. You know, and now people are expecting it, but I really, you know, I worked really hard for a long time uh, uh, on it. So I'm excited for it to finally get into people's hands. And I'm lucky enough that, you know, some of my, some of my super fans have uh, uh, already reached out to me and uh, tell me how much they uh, dig it. So if the, if the super fans of the first book uh, are digging it like you, then that, that's all I need to hear. That, yeah. You know, I mean, it was, it, it's amazing. It really comes across the, like the labor of love is there. Oh, great. Um, and it's really, uh, it, you know, as I said, it was, uh, it was a much needed bomb in, in, in kind of a, a crazy, a crazy year. Um, and what, and what's interesting. So, uh, our, um, my, my boss's son, um, he read it. Um, my boss was telling me today, he read it, uh, over the weekend and my, like he got up and his son was reading it at 2 AM and he's like, what are you doing? And he's like, he's like, Oh man, I'm into this book. <laughs> you know, and it became like a why are you awake why are you awake but i mean it's kind of an amazing thing because you know you know he's a teenager uh but he you know it's still as i said like that was one of the most amazing things about the book um for me as a bookseller was to see how it connected on uh, so many different age levels and on so many different levels period with with readers uh was one of the i think one of the real uh genius parts of of your of your work well, thank so. you so much.
Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, I guess uh, oh, kind of one one last question uh, from, sure. from the audience, and we'll uh, kind of uh, leave it. Um, from uh, Jarrett uh, Sustrin, uh, what is your favorite arcade game? We're pulling it back, what is your favorite arcade game? And what, what games, I think let's expand it a little bit too, like what games are you playing in 2020 as well? New, old, uh, that are, you know, kind of getting you through it? Yeah, good question. Um, well, I think uh, the games I have, I have an arcade uh, in the other room. And the games that I have in there are Black Tiger, which is one of my favorite games and it's featured in Ready Player One. Uh, and then I have Battlezone um uh and tail gunner 2 uh and those are both games that are featured in armada that are kind of like uh uh uh, uh helped inspire that story so i end up buying uh video games that uh i feature in my novels so now i need to get a a ninja princess and uh and some other a few other ones that are mentioned in ready player 2 but uh um the let's see the most uh recent game i've been playing is star wars squadrons which is like the oh, new, yeah. it's like the new upgraded uh x-wing versus tie fighter that we had in the late 90s but it's like and you can play it in vr and you know and look around and see your r2 unit while you're piloting an x-wing or y-wing or a tie fighter it's the coolest uh i bought it for all my friends through steam so we could uh pretend to be you know in the battle of yavin uh so that's a game that i uh have been digging uh recently and also half-life alex which is like the best sure. vr game of all time those guys at valve really knocked it out of the park so those are a few uh games i've been playing and risk i play risk with my friends in big screen uh where you have to kind of raise your headset and take your turn on your phone but then you put it back down and you can see the risk board on the in big screen so that's a pro tip i think i'm the first person to figure out how to play risk in virtual reality uh but um uh yeah those are some games i've been playing risk never gets old risk is always if you're playing with your friends that like play that forever well congratulations on the book um oh. it is just it's a delight um you know uh in I, I i think it'll be really fascinating have you heard have you started hearing little feelers about you know possible film you alluded to it but Yes, yes. There, there, yes. Yep. there have been many uh, feelers, you know, so it's a possibility. You never know. That's a crazy time in Hollywood right now. Uh, but uh, I have I have high hopes. Um, yeah, so we'll cool. see what happens. I do. Before we take off, I want to just thank everybody um, uh, for tuning into this. And uh, I apologize. I wish I could uh, uh, come to Cincinnati and um, uh, uh, shake your guys hands and uh, sign your books in person. Uh, sorry, we can't do it right now, but uh, maybe. Maybe for the paperback, fingers crossed. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah, sooner or later, sooner or later, we'll 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 get the band back together, um, and have and have another blowout event. Um, yeah, but everyone's getting signed copies. Thank you for doing that. Oh, uh, my pleasure. Uh, thanks for for you and your whole team, um, and the team at, at Random House for putting it together. The pins, the signed books. Really, I feel like it's uh, it's a special uh, tour for an incredibly special. Um, Event. I'm doing some more book events like this too. So they're all on readyplayer2.com. Uh, yeah, so you can find awesome Ready Player Two events at readyplayer2.com. Um, and yeah, you can still find uh, books out there, buy books for your friends. Um, it makes a perfect holiday gift. Um, and, it, and it's a fun book to read and talk about. Like that's the thing that uh, has been such a delight too, uh, is sort of getting back together with a lot of longtime booksellers um you know that maybe still are joseph bath or, or have moved on and it's kind of revisiting friendships around this book um, it's it's really a delight and we thank you so much for taking the time to uh thank you and spend with us and thank uh all of you uh, the hundreds of people who have joined us um we hope uh you know that uh for those of you who have the book and have already read it or for those of you who are about to it's absolutely delightful as I mentioned, Will Wheaton does the audiobook justice once again. Um, it was kind of funny because um, I'd listened to the audiobook for the first one uh, so many times that it was fun to have Will start again and immediately fall into to Wade's voice. So yeah, no, he's just perfect. Uh, he, was, he was my first choice every time, and he he knocked it out of the park again. I'm so so grateful. Will is like 
Will's like us. Will's like a, a month younger than me. So he was, he was born the same year and it was just all the same. He does the sound effects for the video games and gets all the, you know, all the movie quotes right. And, uh, and he's just, he performs the whole book. You know, he brings it to life. It's like the first adaptation of the story is Will's, Will's adaptation of it. So uh, uh, I love it. Well, congratulations. Um, you, I'm sure this is going to end up being on, uh, you know, all the best of the year lists and a huge bestseller. Here's hoping for a hundred more than a hundred weeks on the New York Times bestseller list again. That would be um, cool. We're thrilled, and uh, I encourage all of you um, to finish it. Um, sharing is caring. Buy copies for all of your friends um, and bring them into the Oasis with the rest of us. So, Ernest, uh, congratulations! It was great to see you again, uh, even virtually, and I look forward yeah. to seeing you in person. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you guys uh, in person uh, too. Thank you, thank you for hosting this event, and uh, thank oh, all of you God. at home for uh, tuning in. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, well, take care. Um, give my best to your family. Um, yeah, same and, uh, here. yeah, we'll we'll see everyone very very soon. Hopefully, right. on the other all side right. of this. All, all right, right, have a wonderful evening. Take care. You too. Good night, guys. Good night.